Um, so I'm going to talk about some work um, that I've been doing in a large collaboration called Odyssey, and I'll tell you a little bit about Odyssey in, uh, in a few minutes. Um, but I'm going to dive right in uh, before I do that. Uh, so I've been working for the last uh, 15 years or something in, in healthcare, in, in you know, analytical applications, data science applications in, in healthcare, specifically looking at large-scale electronic health record databases and claims databases. Uh, which we now have uh, on a truly large scale. We have, we have uh, medical records on uh, a few hundred million people for upwards of 10 years. And it's an, ex you know, it's an extraordinary resource that can really help us improve uh, what, co what goes on in healthcare. Um, right now, evidence-based medicine largely isn't, and that, that, that is what we're trying to change. So um, what's on the screen is an example of the genre, the kind of study I'm going to talk about. I'm going to zero in on for, uh, for this particular talk. There are, there are other aspects to Odyssey. But I want to, I want to focus in on these kinds of, uh, of studies. So this is uh, published recently. It's, an, an, it's, it's, very just, it, it's very typical of the genre. Real-world comparison of major bleeding risk among non-valvular atrial fibrillation patients initiated on one of four drugs. Okay? So it's, they're doing a comparison of four drugs in a particular cohort of people, people newly diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, and they're interested in the outcome of, of major bleeding. So they did this study in a large claims database with about 100 million um, uh, people in it, about um, yeah, five to 10 years of records for 100 million people. Um, and they, you know, they did a, a propensity score matched analysis, which is by far and away the most commonly used method um, that, that you'll see uh, these days. Um, and they drew a conclusion, which was when comparisons were made, blah, blah, uh, Rivaroxaban patients had a significantly higher risk of major bleeding compared to Apixaban patients. So that's one of their conclusions. And they, they, they give you some statistical artifacts. In this particular case, it's a confidence interval. Okay? And that, that statistical artifact is all important. Okay? If it's narrow you know, and, and north of one, then it, people take that to mean there's something really going on, that, the, that there is a causal effect in play here, that's, that um, it, it's real. And if that interval does not include one, uh, people are, are inclined to dismiss it. And particularly if, it, you know, if it's very wide, they certainly will, will uh, treat, treat this evidence with, with a lot of caution. So that statistical artifact better mean what it purports to mean. Right? It better be the case that 95% of the time, those intervals contain the truth. Right? And 5% of the time, they don't. Or if, you're, if you prefer p-values, which I don't, um, um, you, know, you want that type 1 error rate to be 5% if you're using 5% as your cutoff. Okay? Um, so um, question. Is, is, that, is that the case? Right? What are the operating characteristics of these statistical artifacts? Do they mean what they purport to mean? Are these studies reliable? There's about 10 or maybe you could say even 20 years of sometimes very careful empirical work trying to answer that question. And I, I'm going to show you just one little snippet. But the short version of, of a long story is no, they're not terribly reliable. Type 1 error rates are somewhere in the 30 to 50% you know, range. Coverage of those 95% intervals is somewhere in the 50, 60, 70% range. It's not 92%, right? You know, off a little bit. It's, there's, there's a serious problem with, uh, with the operating characteristics of these, uh, of these studies. Just to make this point in a kind of an anecdotal way, um, here's a paper that appeared in the British Medical Journal, a very fancy journal. Um, about oral bisphosphonates. These are drugs for osteoporosis that are taken by, by millions of people uh, all over the world. Um, and this particular study was done in a large uh, electronic health record database in the United Kingdom, um, looking at the risk of esophageal, I'll just focus on esophageal cancer, esophageal cancer um, for people who take these, uh, these drugs. Um, they drew the conclusion that there's a problem, right? There was a statistically significantly increased risk of esophageal cancer in people who, to, who are taking these drugs. That study made it the, was picked up by the New York Times, it was on the front page of the New York Times, and the usage of these drugs has changed drastically in this country in the last 10 years or so because of this and a few other studies, not, not, not just this one. Um, it's an observational study. Okay. Actually, one thing I should have said is most of the evidence that guides healthcare today comes from studies like this. So randomized, you might think most of it comes from randomized trials. No, it doesn't. Right? There are very few randomized trials. Okay? And in particular, there are very few comparative randomized trials. Right? So it's the, the evidence space, and, and you can quantify this, is large, if you think it's, it's filled in with, with randomized trials, it's not. It's largely empty. These are the kinds of studies that are, 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 um, are filling in the evidence space, although badly, I would claim. Um, OK, around about the same time, paper appeared in JAMA, the Journal of the Ameri American Medical Association. Exact same issue, right? Or uh, bisphosphonates. Fosamax is a drug you might have heard of. Bisphosphonates and esophageal cancer. This one drew the conclusion that there is no association between bisphosphonates and esophageal cancer. So two studies, okay, 
well-meaning, there's no obvious conflict of interest here. I don't think there's anything nefarious going on. Just two well-meaning and highly experienced groups of analysts addressing the exact same question, and here's the kicker, using the same database. Right? They both used the UK GPRD, um, arriving at opposite conclusions. You, you might think to yourself, well, I, you know, I spent months trying to find this example. Uh, mm -mm. Um, you take basically any study, major study, observational study in the medical literature, and with high probability, you will be able to find another study um, arriving at, at, at a different conclusion. So there are many reasons for this. Um, I, I really don't believe much of it is nefarious. It's, it's, there are other reasons. One of them is the process by which we do these studies is kind of like arts and crafts. It's, well, we'll adjust for this, and we won't adjust for that, and we'll exclude this, and we'll do this and that, and all these kind of little decisions. There are dozens of analytic choices that, an that, that, that um, epidemiologists and statisticians and, and so on make when they're conducting one of these studies, and there is absolutely no way to know if they're right or wrong. Right? And, and really no way, because even, even with, say, the bisphosphonates, we'll never really know if those drugs cause esophageal cancer, because no one's ever going to do a randomized trial because it's too expensive. And even then, you might not get the right answer, but that's another day's work. Um, so um, there's a huge amount of hubris in, in the design and conduct of these, of these studies. And that, what's, what's on that slide there is an actual quote, right? I'm a good analyst. My study is right. And the other, the, all the others are, are idiots. Mine is the only one that's right. And that, that's kind of the level of discourse um, in, in this space. So it's, it's not good. Um, over and above that, there are a whole host of issues that, that I, I, everyone in the room is probably familiar with, at least some of these, if not all of these. There are a whole host of issues that bedevil observational studies, right? non-experimental studies. Selection bias, who's included in the study? Measurement error is all over the place here. Model misspecification, multiple modeling, p-hacking, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then the, the, kind of the, the, the mother of all problems, unmeasured confounding. Right? You're comparing people who took bisphosphonates with people who didn't, or people, people who took um, apixaban and people who took warfarin. Well, they may differ in ways other than those drugs. The people who get warfarin are not the same as the people who get a, a newfangled blood thinner. Okay? So you worry, you know, unmeasured confounding is unmeasured, right? So you, you, you certainly worry about that. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, you know, challenges that, that, that are, are apparent here that um, step one, basically, of any one of these papers is let's assume that none of these problems exist, more or less. Or, or let's assume that I've done such a clever analysis that we don't have to worry about these things. And I love this quote from, from uh, Paul Rosenbaum, you know, who are you that you could not be mistaken? Um, so to segue to... Uh, um, usually I spend, about a, I spend about an hour beating up on these studies. I, I, I did it in eight minutes. Um, but what I, but I, I, I tried to persuade you is that, that there's, a little, there's not a little problem. There's a substantial problem, a public health problem, with the way we as a society conduct these kinds of studies, the way we are generating the evidence base for the practice of healthcare. So what Odyssey is about, Odyssey is a co worldwide collaboration um, involving, uh, we've had over uh, 2,000 people involved in various uh, Odyssey uh, activities as active participants. Um, what we're trying to do is come up with a better way, okay? And I want to I tell you a little bit about <clears throat> one particular uh, large project that we're, we're, we're engaged in, which um, I'm not sure if it's a better way, but uh, we, you know, we're, we're, we're working on it. We're trying to improve it. It is certainly, we're trying to at least change the way people think about these studies and do these studies. So there are a few kind of core principles guiding what we're doing. And the first one is that whatever we do has to be reproducible. We're going to try and generate evidence okay, from these databases about the effects of healthcare interventions. Um, it has to be reproducible. None of the studies I showed you are reproducible, like none. I challenge you to find a single observational study in the healthcare literature that you can reproduce. Right? It's, it's, it's um, a huge problem. Um, we want it to be systematized. None of this arts and crafts twiddling knobs to get, you know, to, to, because you feel like it's because it's Tuesday morning and therefore you're going to adjust for this and not for that or, or, or whatever. None of that. <clears throat> Open source approach. So all of this is, is available as our code. Um, and we want to do this at scale. So rather than doing one analysis in one database, what we aim to do is do all analyses in all databases. And we're not there yet, but we're getting there. And I, I, I'll show you. So no, no p-hacking, no cherry-picking, no publication bias. Do all the studies so we can see them all, OK? Um, and at scale, at, at, at very large scale. The centerpiece, the methodological centerpiece of, of what we're doing um, relies on what, what we call and others call negative controls and positive controls. Some of you may know these as falsification hypotheses. So the basic idea of, I'll just focus on negative controls, is we identify in a given situation, you're, you're studying bisphosphonates and esophageal cancer. In that situation, um, you try and identify outcomes that you know are not caused by bisphosphonates. Okay? 
And therein lies, there's a circularity, or how would you know that if you didn't know how to do causal inference properly in, in the first place? Uh, let, let me just slide by that at the moment. We have, a, we have a very elaborate process, an automated process for identifying negative controls. Um, the basic idea is, well, gee, if you have a set of negative controls, then you can get an empirical null distribution. You don't, need to, you don't need to rely on what the textbook says. You don't need to say, step one, let's assume we have an unbiased estimator when we know we don't. Right? So we just run the negative controls through whatever analysis you're doing. That gives you an empirical null distribution, and then you can get at, an empirical, or we call it calibrated, p-value. We have shown over and over in many different circumstances, I'm going to show you one briefly here, um, the, the calibrated p-values have exact, more or less exactly the right type 1 error rate. So we, we essentially adjust the statistical artifacts so that they have the nominal properties. They mean what they purport to mean, which is why I use honest in the title. They're honest, right? Um, we, have, we have a similar process for calibrating confidence intervals. We also have a Bayesian version of this. Um, so we, we adjust the confidence intervals so that they have 95% coverage, okay? Using negative controls and positive controls. And I, I, I can get, I, we'll get into a little bit of the detail, actually. Um, yes. Um, so let me just t t take a step back for a second and tell you a bit about uh, Odyssey. So Odyssey is, there's a coordinating center at Columbia University. Um, but it, it is truly a worldwide endeavor. Um, and it, it's, there are many, many working groups within uh, Odyssey. Many of these working groups have now split into Eastern Hemisphere and Western Hemisphere uh, versions of them, looking at all and any aspect of generating evidence from large-scale healthcare data. It's an open community. Anyone can, can, uh, can join this. There's a very large-scale repository of our code um, that, that runs against what's called the OMOP common data model. So there's, there's a, a piece of this collaboration which is, which is transformative. It's a total game-changer, which is... We developed, we people developed uh, some uh, early on in, in Odyssey and, and a, a predecessor project called OMOP. We developed a common data model okay, for these healthcare databases. If you're going to do this kind of research on, on these kinds of analysis on, on a global scale, you can't be writing code for every last database, right? So we built a common data model. It's now in version six. It's, there's a lot of people, I'm not one of them, but a lot of people uh, engaged in, in this effort. So there are databases all over the world. There are about 80 databases, healthcare databases, large scale around the world that have been mapped to the OMOP common data model. And the, the pins on the map there are where there are Odyssey researchers. Um, and there are Odyssey databases in, in, um, on every continent except Africa, which is we're working on it. Um, so they're mapped to a common data model, which means you write a piece of code, you test a piece of code, say in your local shop, you then send it out, and there's a mechanism to do this, onto the Odyssey network, and people run, no, there's no centralization of data, but they run the code on, in locally in their shop against the common data model, and then we coordinate the results. And this, this enables us to do the kind of research I'm about to describe, which is on, on, a, on, a, on an unprecedented scale. OHDSI.org, I encourage you to, to, to get involved. Okay, so let me, let me do a slightly deep dive, it'll take me three or four minutes into um, the, 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 this idea of negative controls. So we did a large-scale study on depression treatments. And in the context of depression treatments, we identified drug pharmacy, no, not just drug treatments, actually, treatments for depression. Um, we identified about 50 negative controls. So 50 outcomes that we believe are not caused, so the true relative risk is one, they're not caused by any of the mainstream depression treatments. Okay? So, what I'm showing you here is, I'm going to show you a few pictures like this. On the horizontal axis, each dot is a negative control. It right? is a study, if you will. Okay? Um, the horizontal axis is the point estimate. So one is the, is the null value, so hazard ratio or relative risk scale or uh, whatever. The vertical axis is the standard error. Right? So you get to be statistically significant if you're under those dashed lines. If you have a big point estimate, um, uh, and or a small standard error, you get to be statistically significant. And if you're above it, you're not statistically significant. Okay? So what you see here, this, this particular analysis is an unadjusted comparison of two drugs with respect to a particular outcome. I think it's MI. Um, what you see here is what should be 5%. Okay? Um, sorry, can we go back? What should be 5% okay, using a crude unadjusted estimate, which is, is, is a very problematic way to do a study, um, and you might think nobody would do it. In fact, it was one in the New England Journal of Medicine very recently. Um, six, the type 1 error rate here is 68%. Okay? And this is not p-hacking. This is just inability to control for selection bias, non-measured confounding, and uh, uh, all those issues. Um, you do with, if you do an adjusted method, this is a, a, a high-dimensional propensity score adjustment, um, it does much better in this particular context. So the type 1 error rate now, if you do a fancier method, is 16%. Right? 
But 16% is pretty far away from 5%, right? It's nowhere near what it, what it, what it, what it should be nominally. The basic idea of the p-value calibration is we adjust, in, in a purely empirical way, we in, adjust the boundaries for statistical significance. Okay, and you can see there, it's not, it's not a huge, because it was only, it was 16% here, it wasn't so far off 5%. The adjustment is relatively modest in this particular case. But after calibration, the type 1 error rate is, is 5%. This is a good example. This is what it looks like on a good day. Okay? Um, here's here's a, an example of what it can look like. So sometimes calibration makes a huge difference. And think of it in terms of confidence intervals. Sometimes it widens the confidence intervals a small bit. Sometimes it widens the confidence intervals considerably based on the experience with the negative controls and the, um, and the positive controls. OK, so that's, that's the kind of core methodological idea. So we've just finished um, a study in, in the context of treatments for hypertension. Do I have 20 minutes or 30 minutes? 20 minutes. OK. Um, we just finished a, a study in the context of hypertension. Uh, this is the, what prompted this is the recent publication of new treatment practice guidelines for depression by the American Car College of Cardiology and various other august organizations. Um, this document is 56 pages. It has 106 recommendations about hypertension treatment. About half of them are based on expert opinion only. No evidence. Okay? So what we set out to do, what we have done, is we took the 40 or so major treatments for hyper, pharmaceutical treatments for hypertension, antihypertensive drugs. And what we're doing is we're going to look at all pairwise comparisons. So we're going to do 40 choose two studies, right? Every head-to-head -head comparison of, uh, of these drugs. We're going to do it for 58 outcomes of interest. These are the outcomes that are, are, are identified in the guidelines as the primary things that cardiologists are interested in. Some of them are good effects, some of them are bad effects, okay? So 58 outcomes of interest. We have 76 negative controls for the hypertension drugs, outcomes that we don't believe are associated with uh, any, any of these drugs. And we, run, we ran this analysis in nine databases uh, around the world, this particular analysis. The union of these databases has about 250 million patients. We have about 5 million new users of antihypertensives uh, in, uh, in the union of these databases. The study design we implemented is a fairly straightforward high dimensional propensity scoring, uh, propensity scoring design. Um, High dimensional meaning that the propensity models have about a half a million predictors. They use the entire medical record uh, for prediction purposes. But it's a fairly vanilla, albeit at scale, uh, propensity method. But we do the calibration. So we, ins we ensure afterwards with this post-processing step that the 95% intervals cover the truth 95% of the time. So we've gone from, the, on the left is the 40 drugs are around the circle. The, it, I don't know that you can even see it. There are a handful of randomized trials that provide evidence about the comparisons. So we've just filled it in. Okay? So here are the legend results. We did 10,278 comparisons. It's a total of 1.3 million studies um, that, we've, that we've done. There are the results. Okay? So that's, that's all studies on hypertension for all outcomes, if you, if you give me a little poet, uh, poetic license. Um, so here, about 84%, 85% of these um, studies are not statistically significant. So 15% of them are statistically significant. That shouldn't necessarily be 5% because some of these really are real, right? The, the actual studies and the actual hypertension treatments are the actual outcomes of interest. Just for comparison purposes, that's what the medical literature looks like. So we did a scrape of observational studies from the medical literature and extracted uh, point estimates and standard errors. Let me flick forwards and backwards. That's what it looks like if there's no publication bias, no p-hacking, and correction for the factors that I mentioned. That's what the literature looks like. We have a problem. Um, OK, let me finish with the following. Um, so we, there is an issue about, OK, 1.3 million studies. How do you browse this? How do you understand this? How do you interact with something, evidence on this kind of scale? So we have built a variety of, uh, let me skip this in the interest of time. We've done comparisons with randomized trials. I, I, we could talk about that offline. Um, so we've built a whole a variety of viewers and ways of visualizing. This is all available right now. You can get it on your, on your device. Um, the Legend Basic Viewer takes you, what allows you to drill down on any one study. If I could click on the, the lower link, please. So we built something that we thought was a bit of a gimmick. We call it Legend Med Central to mimic PubMed Central, which should come up in a second. So we thought this was a gimmick, because um, what, what, what I'm about to show you, hopefully, all going well, Oh, there it is, okay, on the screen. Um, what I'm about to show you is uh, um, an, an example of this. So we're drilling down. You pick a drug and you pick a comparator. Right? These are all A-B studies in this particular context. You pick an outcome that you're interested in, uh, pick angioedema, or it uh, happens to be one I did earlier on. You pick one of those databases, or you can do a meta-analysis, pick CCAE. 
and then click search. So what you're doing is you're drilling down on one dot in the cloud. So this is angioedema risk and new users of the syndrome. You can click on that, please. You get an abstract that describes the study and the results of the study. And you can go one step further, and if you bear with me, this takes about 20 seconds. You can generate the PDF document. All going well. It's generating the PDF over there. It takes a few seconds. What you're about to see is a full-blown paper, automatically generated. Right? It has everything you would see in a published paper except for the literature review. That's the one thing we haven't automated. But other than that, it is a complete description of an observational study. So we, 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 there it is. So we can generate, and if you scroll down through that, you'll see Kaplan-Meier curves and, and sh uh, plots showing pr um, balance before and after propensity adjustment and, and so on and so forth. So as I said, we, we, we did this for fun, but in fact, it's a serious way of actually visualizing and interacting with this results, this massive uh, results database. Um, thank you. I'll stop there.